from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 21, recorded on December 1st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello, Paul. Welcome back to Beyond the Noise. Looking forward to today. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, I'd like to take a closer look at Paul's recent column, Putting Floridians at Risk, Florida's Vaccine Policy is Ill-Founded and Potentially Dangerous. So let's start, Paul, with uh, the Florida Surgeon General making a provider alert. What is it that he said? So in October, Florida's um, Surgeon General, a guy named Dr. Joseph Ladapo, issued a provider alert. Now, most states don't have Surgeon Generals. I think Florida is one of only four states that do. But his provider alert said that everyone um, over 65 should get this current vaccine, but those under 65 should not. So there, there are two sort of flaws in that recommendation. The first is that by, by saying everyone under 65 should not get this new COVID vaccine, he's excluding several high risk groups who would likely benefit, such as, for example, people who are immune compromised, people who have high risk medical conditions like obesity or diabetes or chronic lung, heart or kidney disease, and pregnant people, all of whom are less than 65. By saying everyone over 65 should get it, he's probably including a number of people who are less likely to benefit if you look at, for example, at most recent CDC data, of those who are over 65 who are hospitalized, 99% have at least one comorbidity and 90% have two comorbidities, meaning health problems that put them at risk. So why have a healthy 65-year-old get a vaccine when they're less likely to benefit? So I don't understand that recommendation. Um, it was certainly supported by uh, Ron DeSantis, who's the governor of Florida, who said, we are going to stand up to Washington edicts and sort of fight the good fight against sort of current public policy, but it just didn't make sense on its surface. So Ladapo says that the COVID boosters don't work. And why is that statement incorrect? Right. So, so uh, Dr. Ladapo pointed to a study that was published in Lancet out of Qatar, um, where they looked at a little over two million people who had gotten at least two doses, uh, and then about a third of whom went on to get a third dose to see whether the vaccine protected against severe disease, which is the goal of this vaccine keep people out of the hospital, out of the intensive care unit, out of the morgue. And what they found was that for people who were in high-risk groups, or even people who weren't in high-risk groups, the vaccine was about 75% effective at preventing severe disease. But that's not the part of the study that Dr. Ladapo focused on. He focused on the part of the study that looked not at severe disease, but at mild disease, and found that, that at least in that study, that those who had received the third dose didn't have very good protection over time against just infection. Now, the, the, the problem with, with focusing on that part of the study was that numbers were small, confidence intervals were wide, and even in that study, in the discussion section, the authors of the study said that basically this wasn't a reliable finding because of those both small numbers and broad confidence intervals. But nonetheless, that's what he uh, focused on, which is too bad. Also, those kinds of studies are always fraught in the sense that, that it's not controlled. So, so of those who chose to get a third dose, that group may be different in terms of their, their medical background or their, their activity that puts them at risk as compared to people who don't choose a second dose. So it's always hard to make those, um, those calls on those kinds of studies. But in any case, um, the study did support the notion that vaccine prevented severe disease. So he was referring to a study that really proved the opposite of his point. Dr. Ladapo also says that the mRNA vaccines are unsafe. What, what are your thoughts about that statement? Right. And, and when he said that, uh, Dr. Ladapo pointed to the fact that COVID vaccines can cause myocarditis or pericarditis, which is certainly true. Um, it occurs in maybe uh, one per um, 100,000 people, uh, roughly over sort of all age groups. But the virus does it too. The virus mm -hmm. also can cause um, myocarditis, pericarditis in roughly one in 5,000 people, and which is to say at a 20-fold greater rate than the vaccine. And when the virus does it, um, it causes myocarditis much more 
more severely than does the vaccine. In 2020, before there was a vaccine, I would say the most common reason for children to come into our hospital, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, was MIS-C, this multi-system inflammatory disease, which 50 to 75 percent of the time was was, uh, confounded by having myocarditis, which was severe. Um, I'd never seen so much myocarditis, and that was associated with the virus, not the vaccine. And then when the vaccine came out, and we were seeing for the first time, you know, this myocarditis, usually seen in in, uh, boys or young men, usually four days uh, after the second dose, it was very mild. They would come into the hospital initially because we weren't sure of what we were seeing because we had no experience with this as a vaccine problem, but very quickly they would get discharged, and then we just stopped admitting them. So let me understand this, Paul. Dr. Ladapo says the vaccines don't work, yet he still recommends them for over 65. Right. So if he's arguing that vaccines don't work and they're unsafe, then don't recommend them at all. Um, but he's arguing that, that uh, no, no, they don't work and they're unsafe, but everybody over 65 should get them. So it, it, there was just no logic to his reasoning uh, or his recommendation. And, uh, you know, it, it's... um. This is a provider alert. It goes to all healthcare personnel in the state of Florida, and it just put Floridians at unnecessary risk and at best was confusing. So the, uh, you, you pointed out that the, they, they're trying in Florida to counter a Washington edict, but it's not really Washington. It's the CDC, and it's just a recommendation. Isn't that correct? That's right. The CDC doesn't make edicts. It makes <laughs> recommendations, and they're not in Washington. They're in Atlanta, Georgia. So this, what is the CDC recommendation on uh, the, the new vaccine that you know, came out this fall that we've talked about? Right. So I think we, we uh, are a little confused, I think, in the way that we're, we're um, presenting this, because the, the, the terms that have been used variously have been either booster dose or campaign. So, so every year we have a campaign to give an influenza vaccine for people over six months of age. Um, we've sort of morphed from booster dose, the yearly booster dose for this virus, COVID, SARS-CoV-2, to a campaign. And, and it's, it's a little confusing. I mean, I think if the goal of the vaccine is to prevent severe disease, um, who, who gets severe disease? Who's getting hospitalized? And according to the CDC data, there are high-risk groups, which we just mentioned. Mm. People who are pregnant, immune compromised, high-risk medical conditions. Um, and even those who are older, um, they, they often have high-risk medical conditions, almost always have high-risk medical conditions. So focus on those groups. And if you talk to people um, in healthcare, in public health, um, I think it becomes a messaging issue. I think there are those who believe that by saying everybody over six months of age should get this new vaccine, that that means it's much more likely that those in high-risk groups will get it. There are others who would argue by targeting high-risk groups, that makes them more likely to get. This is a testable hypothesis. I'm not sure it's it's been tested, but I think that's what this is coming down to more than anything else, which is, I think, a best messaging issue. If I recall, Florida has made some other um, statements that don't make sense in a public health context. Don't they discourage masking, for example? Yes, very early on, they discouraged masking. And although they roundly took up monoclonal antibodies when they came out, setting up sites for monoclonal antibodies to be given, they weren't as quick to take up uh, vaccines or even antivirals. So I, I have trouble figuring it all out. I think Dr. Ladapo has historically made uh, statements that are not necessarily grounded in science. So this is not new for him. So really the question, Paul, is why is Florida doing this? Dr. Ladapo and the governor, why are they making these statements that don't make any sense from a public health perspective? Right. I think we're seeing what we've seen a lot in the last three plus years, which is politics trumping science. I think this is a political statement. We're going to push back on Washington. We're tough. We're not going to knuckle under to, you know, what things that Tony Fauci says or Mandy Cohen, who's head of the CDC, says, when in fact it has nothing to do with them and has everything to do with what's best for Floridians. And that what's best for Floridians is based on the scientific studies that show there are high risk groups that are very likely to benefit. And those are the groups I think that should be focused upon. It's so unfortunate that politics and science and public health get mixed up because public health and science is all about keeping people healthy and apparently politics is not. No, you know, I think there's always to some extent a politics to public health in the sense that um, public health requires resources and resources and how they're distributed is at, at some level political. But I think what's happened is it's become partisan, which is novel. 
Right. And that doesn't make any sense as far as I can tell. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. You can read the full column over at Beyond the Noise. We'll put a link uh, in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.